Hello, everyone, and thank you again for taking a work break with us and joining today's webinar. Um, we will listen to Professor Michael Segrew's uh, reflections on the Book of the Courtier in just a couple of minutes. Um, I'm going to let people get in. It always takes a little bit for everybody to get fully logged in. Uh, while we're waiting, uh, please make sure that you change your chat panel uh, to the selection with all attendees and panelists. So that if you do have any questions or comments that you want uh, the other attendees to see, they can. Um, we will also be sharing the chat log uh, with everybody. And so that allows us to be able to share those comments so that people can see uh, what people thought of the lecture. A 16th century book of manners that has become a snapshot of what it was to be an ideal courtier. That's the book that we're, uh, courtier, that's the book that we're looking at today. It's categorized as both philosophy as well as instructive. Uh, the Book of the Courtier was a bestseller in the time of the Renaissance and is still studied at length today. We are looking at today's webinar as a give and take discussion about the Book of the Courtier and would love to hear all of those questions that Dr. Segrew's lecture may inspire. So today I have again the great pleasure to welcome Dr. Michael Segrew to our ongoing webinar series. This is the sixth in our series in our Classics Revisited um, and we are looking forward to doing more in the new year as well. Dr. Segrew is a professor of history at Ave Maria University. A graduate of the Great Books program, he earned his BA in history from the University of Chicago and his MA, Masters of Philosophy and PhD in history from Columbia University. Prior to taking his position at Ave Maria University, Professor Sugru taught at Princeton University, Columbia University, Johns Hopkins University, and so many more. My name is Christy Goebel. I'm the Global Marketing Specialist here at Biblioteca, and behind the scenes today, we have my colleague Kelly Knutson helping to make sure everything runs smoothly and answering any questions in the chat panel. We will be sharing the chat log, as I said, uh, with all attendees, so make sure you do switch your settings to all attendees and panelists so that we can see what you may put in there. If you have specific questions for the professor, please use the Q&A panel. Uh, we love getting those questions in. It really does make a difference in how these webinars go. The like button does help float the most popular questions to the top. So please use that feature if you see a similar question or something that you do want answered. And once again, we do look at today's webinar as a give and take discussion and would love to hear all of those questions. With that, I'm going to hand things over to Michael. We've recorded his reflections in advance, but Dr. Sagru will join us at the end to take live questions. The courtier is one of the most entertaining and thought-provoking books from the Italian Renaissance. It has been read for many centuries as a guide to conduct, as a, a a set of rules for a polished gentleman, not just in the Renaissance, but for centuries thereafter. James Joyce once read, when he read the Castiglione's book of the courtier, his brother told him that he uh, had grown more polite, but less sincere. And that's actually a very good way of putting it. The courtier has an image to present. Now, a good sense of Castiglione and the image that he presented can be found in the portrait of Castiglione that was painted by Raffler. A couple of things of note are noteworthy here. First of all, if you're going to have your portrait done, get it done right. Castiglione could tell the good stuff when he saw it. There were lots of painters in the Italian Renaissance. He gets Raffler, which is telling us something. Okay, um, he's an esthete, he's a connoisseur. Um, he is an all round excellent man, um, something like a, a man for all seasons. Now, Castiglione writes his handbook for the courtier um, over a period of more than uh, 10 years, all right? So uh, he uh, was at the court of Urbino, which is where the book is said, uh, from 1508 to 1516, and uh, the book itself is set at a time when Castiglione is absent from the court. 
He's on a diplomatic mission to England. So Castiglione writes about an idealized court and an idealized courtier, but he absents himself so as to allow himself to take the position of various speakers on various matters. All of the speakers are polished courtiers. All of the ladies are very polished, uh, highly educated women, and they are all uh, an admirable set of almost platonic interlocutors. And they talk over a period of four nights, and the topic of the evening is love, and inevitably includes men and women and God and uh, other platonic uh, questions, because at this time, of course, Italian, the Italian Renaissance was powerfully influenced by the influx of platonic texts. So the courtier, once again, Castiglione, knows the good stuff when he sees it. A big chunk of book four, for example, is stolen from uh, the symposium by Plato. All right. So, uh, Castell Castiglione is court called away, finally, in 1816, and he then, Edison rewrites the book for a period of 10 years, All right? So it goes through multiple revisions. It is very carefully written out, and you could get a sort of sense of that if you look at the uh, portrait by Raphael. He is a man to be taken seriously. He is uh, not someone to trifle with. He's not malignant, but it's, he's very hard to read. I imagine he would be both a very good poker player and a very formidable adversary in political maneuvering, all right? In other words, in some respects, he's got the, the brain of Henry Kissinger. He's knowledgeable about history and philosophy and. Uh, a great many things which will influence diplomatic uh, capacity. At the same time, he's well-dressed. His clothes are expensive, but not flashy. There's no bling bling. He doesn't want to look like a fool. He doesn't want very much attention and he doesn't say very much. And he doesn't say anything that's not well considered. So Castiglione's courtier, plays things very close to his chest. He's a man in middle age, uh, of fully in his faculties. He's a seasoned individual, and he knows how to do uh, almost anything that might be called upon a courtier. He can fight, he can write verse, he can dance, he can sing. He can do everything so apparently except for play chess because it takes too long to be good. Here we have the, the uh, <laughs> the sound of a, perhaps a, a frustrated chess player. And everything else though, uh, Castiglione's courtier is the best. He can fight, he can plan military strategy. He can be trusted with sensitive documents or military affairs or diplomatic questions. He's uh, the right-hand man to the, the Duke, who is the rightful uh, a ruler. And uh, not only is the Duke the rightful ruler, but the Duke's wife, the Duchess, she, super, she is at the head of these four nights of discussion because the Duke is a, a, a chronic invalid. He's an old man. He's been sickly for a long time. And regrettably, he hasn't been able to take part in these discussions. So they are led by the Duchess. And uh, her name is Elis Elisabetta. And because... Renaissance courtiers know they have to be practiced in flattery. Castiglione describes the Duchess as being the, the recipient of all of God's graces and all the good qualities you could ever expect in a woman. She is a kind of uh, Laura, or a kind of perfect feminine uh, beauty, as well as discretion, as well as judgment, perhaps like Penelope. So uh, Elisabetta, is a wonderful head of the table for the discussions between men and women about love and life. All right. Now, for background here, Plato is important, but it is important not to overlook that Ovid's art of love is very important. All right. It's a guide to seduction written by a Roman poet. All right. 
Now, you have to remember that Castiglione himself and his ideal courtier are a kind of hybrid, a splicing together of the gravity and seriousness and brains of, say, Kissinger, and at the same time, the coolness, the what, he, what, what uh, Castiglione calls spezzatura, all right, making hard things look easy, uh, that we might associate with James Bond, all right? So um, he always looks cool. He never gets ruffled. Um, nothing throws him, and he is very popular with women. Uh, men respect him. Women swoon for him. Uh, he is a very important man simply by virtue of his excellence, what Machiavelli called virtu. And in some ways, uh, this is a book about the virtues necessary for a courtier. And we find that uh, he has to be able to do a lot of things, but, and speaking and writing are very important among them. Now, there's a problem here. I, have been, I had been reading this book for 20 or 25 years, the way everybody else reads it. Um, and there's a book called uh, The Fortunes of the Court here, which looks at the way people have interpreted the court here um, over about 500 years. And uh, the interpretation I wanna propose, as far as I know, has never been proposed. But let me take a crack at it. Um, this book is not what it seems. It's got a painting under a painting. And I, I'd like to have an x-ray done of uh, the Raphael portrait as well. But here's the point. There's another story being told here. Here's what goes on, all right? Uh, Castiglione goes to uh, the court of Urbino. The Duke is an invalid. His wife, the Duchess, uh, is at the court and is a central figure at court. Um, he uh, was at that court from 1808 to 1816. 1816, um, he leaves, and uh, in 1818, he writes, or rather, he works as the Papal Nuncio to Spain. Now, this is probably the most important diplomatic job in, in uh, Europe. Here's why. When the, when Castiglione leaves. He leaves because the, the Pope requires it. Um, in Catholic Italy or Catholic France or Catholic Spain, if the Pope summons you, um, you are expected to show up. Castiglione does. He's known to be an excellent man and, and an admirable courtier. He gets made papal nuncio to Spain. You have to remember, this is the time when astonishing, completely uh, unprecedented Lucre is flowing into Spain. This is coming from the Mesoamerican civilizations, and Spain is spending big on military hardware and on mercenaries. What that means is that it is a formidable power becoming more formidable by the day, and the Pope is afraid of them. So this is a very touchy situation, particularly because we had the advent of the Protestant Re Reformation under Luther at the same time. So Castiglione of necessity has to become a churchman. He is, eventually rises to the post of bishop and, he, and he's eventually the Bishop of Avila. And uh, the Pope claims that he double crossed him, but it's not clear that he could have kept the King of Spain from invading the Papal States when they had uh, a dispute. Now, what's unusual about this? Well, there's a joke, which is described as a stupid joke, and it's at the beginning of the book. And it's on, if you look at the George Bull Penguin translation, it's on page 48. And here's what it says. It says, almost all women hate rats and love snakes. And a student of mine came up to me about 10 years ago or so and said that, she, she and the other, and her, her other friends who are women, um, didn't like rats or snakes. And she didn't understand the joke. And she also didn't understand what the punchline was, because there wasn't any. And I was about to tell, to tell her the answer when I realized I didn't know the answer. So I went back and looked at it. And here's what I tried to do, to figure out why 
but almost all women hate rats and love snakes. Now we have to take into, into account page 67 and, and uh, 66 and 67, that's spezzatura, the birth of the cool. You, you can't let difficult things seem difficult because if that's revealed, it discredits a man. Um, the court here is very careful with words. Page 257 and 8. To win the favors of women, every gentleman and knight makes good use of the noble recreations, fine clothes, and elegant manners. And, he's so, and so he rightly chooses his words for the very same purpose. Now on 254, we find out that men are, widely, are wily seducers, and seduced women are not blameworthy. This is reflexivity. He is talking about this book. It's connected to Ovid's Art of Love. On page 178, 187, he says a, a lady's honor must always be protected and never disclose any transgression. He does that again on page 195, and again on page 198, and again on page 201, and then again on page 242, and then again on page 245, in which he says, men that kiss and tell should be tortured to death because it doesn't matter whether they're telling the truth or not, because if they've tricked some woman and seduced her, they deserve to be treated harshly. And if they are telling a lie, they also deserve to be treated with great cruelty. And so, as I said again, a good courtier can keep his mouth shut. Now, it turns out that on page 253, the poor duchess is lonely. Isn't that sad? The poor duchess. And now I must say a word about our duchess, who has lived with her husband for 15 years like a widow. Those who resist the assaults of love are truly admirable, and those who are sometimes overcome deserve all our compassion. On page 260 and 261, Castiglione's courtier, just, or Castiglione justifies adultery. I think you are imposing excessively hard rules on married women. For there are many to be found whose husbands hate them for no reason at all and do them great injury. And what that, and, and when that happens, why do you not want the woman to be allowed to give to others what her husband not only despises but detests? If women in other circumstances do not respond to those who love them, they are doing themselves an injury. Page 264, the Duchess has lovers. If my court lady fails to win the love of those whose intentions are impure, this does not mean she will lack for lovers, she, she, for she will find many who are inspired both by her merits and for their own and by their own worth. Sounds like we're having technical difficulties. One second, let me see if I can get the video started again. There we go. Castiglione even gives gives us a mimesis of his version of courtly love because he seduced the Duchess. My apologies. One second. Uh, that lovely technical difficulty is always fun. The courtier is and again on page 198, and again on page 201, and then again on page 242, and then again on page 245, in which he says, men that kiss and tell should be tortured to death because it doesn't matter whether they're telling the truth or not, because if they've tricked some woman and seduced her, they deserve to be treated harshly. And if they are telling a lie, they also deserve to be treated with great cruelty. And so, as I said again, a good courtier can keep his mouth shut. Now, it turns out that on page 253, the poor duchess is lonely. Isn't that sad? The poor duchess. And now I must say a word about our duchess, who has lived with her husband for 15 years like a widow. Those who resist the assaults of love are truly admirable, and those who are sometimes overcome deserve all our compassion. On page 260 and 261, Castiglione's courtier, 
just or Castiglione justifies adultery. I think you are imposing excessively hard rules on married women, for there are many to be found whose husbands hate them for no reason at all and do them great injury. And what that and, and when that happens, why do you not want the woman to be allowed to give to others what her husband not only despises but detests? If women in other circumstances do not respond to those who love them, they are doing themselves an injury. Page 264, the Duchess has lovers. If my court lady fails to win the love of those whose intentions are impure, this does not mean she will lack for lovers, she, she, for she will find many who are inspired both by her merits and for their own and by their own worthiness. Castiglione even gives us a mimesis of his version of courtly love, because he seduced the Duchess and he became the de facto ruler of the city, Urbino, without firing a shot. And he and the Duchess used to play a game that could be found on page 270. I have sometimes heard between two lovers a long and open conversation of love, which, which those present failed to understand at all clearly or to realize was at all amorous. And it was because of this discretion and wariness of the lovers for without showing any displeasure at being overheard, they whispered the only words that mattered and spoke aloud those that could be interpreted in various other ways. Castiglione must have been talking about those two lovers. Who do you imagine the other one was? Castiglione has to have been one. And uh, I can tell you because he explains who the other one was metaphorically and how this works. On page 72, we find out that writing is subtle and a veiled subtlety can cause his reader to be more attentive and aware. Castiglione on page 177 is the king of Spezzatura. A very sophisticated joke relies on a certain amount of dissimulation. Page 181, disguised joke. Those witticisms are also very telling where the humor is subtly disguised. Page 116, Prudence is foremost, but his pride gets the better of him. Our courtier will pay attention to the occupation of those with whom he is speaking, and he will behave accordingly. And he should speak in one way with men and another with women. And if he should want to suggest something of his own credit, he will do so with dissimulation, as if purely by chance, and in passing, and with the discretion and caution that Count Ludovico explained to us yesterday. Castiglione can't help himself. He made himself de facto prince by seducing the Duchess. He took control of the government without firing a shot. He's so successful that nobody knew, and he feels compelled to tell his picaresque story. On page 120, he says, I want him, the courtier, to dissimulate the care and effort that are necessary to any competent performance. And then here's a beautiful Im image. It's a very complicated rhetorical construction. It is uh, reflexive. Page 78, a simile about metaphors. Sometimes I would like him to use certain words in a metaphorical sense, putting them to novel use like a gardener grafting a branch on a healthier trunk, and so increasing their attractiveness and beauty, so that what is said or written makes us seem to experience things at first hand and greatly increases our enjoyment. This autobiographical arboreal symmetry, a simile about metaphors an example, is an example of the subtle ambiguity of spezzatura, because the topic is ambiguous. Who knows, when speaking privately with the Duchess, whether the discussion of a clever gardener grafting a potentially flourishing young branch from an old sickly trunk onto a vigorous new trunk refers to deciduous trees or coniferous trees or family trees. <laughs> Page 267, it says the seducer needs plausible deniability through ambiguity. Well, if he wants to speak or write, continued the Magnifico, he should do so with such modesty and care that to start with his words should seem wholly tentative and even ambiguous and affect her in such a way that she may legitimately pretend, if she wished to avoid embarrassment, not to understand what is meant. Thus, if he finds difficulties in the way, he can withdraw easily and pretend uh, to have written or, or spoken some other purpose in view. The Book of the Courtier, 
the background uh, book is mimesis of their love affair. And the reason why women love snakes and hate rats is because Castiglione is a snake, but not a rat. And he doesn't rat out the Duchess. He waits until the Duchess dies in 1826 before he sends it to the printer. And after doing the galleys and revising it finally in 27, he has it published in 1828 to great acclaim. But he leaves in this stupid joke, which is the text says it's stupid. And what's stupid about it is that I think the trapper got trapped. I think Castiglione actually fell in love with the Duchess, even though he's a great seducer. And what I would compare this to is Machiavelli's uh, comedy, Mandragola, which is all about sexual politics and all about covert deal making. And the reason and the punchline to the stupid joke is the entire book. That's why women hate rats, but love snakes. Castiglione, but maybe a serpent, but he's no rat. All right, uh, I'm gonna turn my video back on here and I'm hoping uh, Professor Segru can join us. I'm here. Wonderful, I apologize for the uh, technical difficulties there. Don't know what paused it the first time, but we managed to get it going again. So I'm glad for that. Uh, thank you to everybody for sticking around. Uh, we are excited to, to continue on this conversation. Uh, I found the lecture actually really, really interesting. And uh, I have a number of questions, I'm sure, but I always prefer to go to the audience first for those, uh, mostly because you and I get, get some side time to chat through some of those questions. Sure. Um, well, a couple of them do come in. We did have one early off um, at the beginning of the presentation. You mentioned it was stolen from something, that the book was stolen from something. Oh. They couldn't quite hear what you had said. So what was it stolen from? Plato's Symposium. That's Plato's, well, one of Plato's two erotic dialogues. The other one is the Phaedrus. But the Symposium is about love and uh, the connection between love and platonic knowledge and platonic ideals. So symposium. Wonderful, thank you so much. We did have a couple of questions also come in from the registrations. Uh, one is just like, can you just give a context of, of the basic history of the book? You did it so a little bit at the beginning, uh, but can you put it into to place of what was happening in Europe and in the world at the time, just so that they have a little bit of context? Sure. sure. Um, this is one of the most explosively dynamic generations in the history of the world. This is Europe in the generation, or say, uh, yeah, the generation after 1492. And that is arguably the most important and transformative event in the history of the world. This permanently connects the various continents. And one of the results is uh, disease-driven demographic collapse in the new world. And one of the outcomes of that is an enormous amount of money floods into Spain and Spain goes on uh, a rampage, dominates 16th century European politics. I mean, so much money comes in that there's actually a revolution in prices as inflation causes the formerly fixed prices to double and then treble and then quadruple. This is what's behind Thomas More's uh, Sheep That Eat Men, if you know Utopia, all right? So um, what's going on is Western Europe is all of a sudden filthy rich for no good reason. And most of it fo is focused on Spain. So, uh, and from there, it gets spent all over Europe to buy mercenaries, to buy ships, to buy armaments. So one of the results is, as this money flows in, is that there's a hypertrophy of the armaments industry and of technology, technological breakthroughs in armaments, because uh, um, the Spaniards have the cash to pay for cannons with the proper alloys that don't blow up. So they, in other words, they're dumping a tremendous amount of money into arms and arms technology. And that helps the Westerners leap ahead in that century, right? 
uh, one of the funny things is that it means the Aztecs and the Incas paid the tab for uh, the wars of the Ref of the Reformation. <laughs> Got it. Um, now, kind of piggybacking off of that, one of the questions that I had was um, the context of the historical significance of the book in Europe at the time. And then it, and it was also widely published in so many languages right away. Um, and, it, and is that typical of literature at the, at the time in, in the Renaissance? By no means. This is a bestseller. This is a runaway New York Times number one. Everybody that's literate is talking about it first in Italy as one of the great literary achievements of the mm -hmm. Italian Renaissance, and then all through uh, Western Europe. And this has gone on actually for centuries and for good reason. The advice that Castiglia, I mean, reading it as a straight etiquette book, the advice is excellent. Um, what Castiglione is doing, at least on in the surface reading, the, the etiquette book reading, is showing you how to, is showing a young man who is inexperienced with court life how to grow up fast and develop something like gravitas, or if you know what the Romans meant by that, seriousness, the kind of, of personal presence that makes people defer and listen seriously when an individual talks. In order to get listened to seriously, you first have to learn to shut up. The next thing you need to learn is who you're talking to. And the third thing you need to learn is what you're talking about. So what he's trying to do is show you, suppose you were to find yourself on a corporate board or working in the White House or working at any of the higher echelons of government or as an ambassador, the American ambassador to wherever you want. How do you not make a fool of yourself? Well, actually, Castiglione's courtier is as true today, for the most part, as it was then. You learn how to be charming with everyone. You don't, you're not mean to your inferiors, and you're not fawning towards your superiors. Uh, you discharge your duties in the best possible way, and you know how to keep your mouth shut, and you know how to talk, which is a rare combination, All right? So um, one, of, one of the follow-ups I have is like, you know, the book, you know, the, when I learned about the book, I, I hadn't read it, uh, but when I, when I learned about it, I always learned that it was like kind of a book of manners, a how-to book and, 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 that, and that was how it was viewed. Um, some of my studying to prepare for this uh, lecture was also that it's also viewed very philosophically, um, especially certain points. Now I have more in-depth questions later on, depending on what other questions may come in, but was it viewed more as a how-to manners book or more of a ph philosophical book when at the time of its publication? And how is it viewed now by scholars? Has that shifted? Well, okay. Um, I'm not, I think the categories are not discrete. They overlap pretty clearly in this. You know, it's a, it's a little bit like saying, is Plato Greek literature, is Plato Greek philosophy? Well, he's both. So um, I think this is a multi-category book. And that's to say the least, because I think there's a, a subtext that runs all through it. But even taking it, leaving the subtext out, you know, the seduction and the love affair, um, apart from that, um, it bespeaks a certain sort of Platonism. Because remember, Plato is the great um, new uh, influence intellectually in the Italian Renaissance. It's, it's, a, it's contrasted with the centrality of Aristotle to the Middle Ages. So uh, after the fall of, or just before the fall of Constantinople, a lot of scholars uh, felt they had to leave. And when they did, they brought their Greek books with them. Among these were Greek texts of Plato, which had been lost for a very long time. Uh, the Middle Ages had very little Plato left. And so when they brought that in, it had a very big impact. One of these impacts was a kind of optimism about uh, human potential. Uh, in other words, instead of the old Augustinian sense of human depravity and we're all born sinful and awful and wretched, uh, someone like Pico della Mirandola, who is a leading Platonist, one of the, the first translators of Plato, uh, for, first from Greek to Latin, and then others did it from, from the Latin to Italian to make it really accessible. 
but uh, Pico wrote that beautiful oration on the dignity of man. And it's hard for people to find it shocking today, but back then it was because human beings weren't dignified then. We were blind and erring and, you know, we were full of original sin and all the rest of that. To write an oration on the dignity of man um, is a pretty nervy thing to do. And to do it at the time of Columbus suggests that uh, we have new perspectives that the ancients never even dreamed of. And that's part of our dignity. On the other hand, um, the danger here is that first of all, it eliminates old authorities for better and for worse. I mean, if Aristotle and the Bible didn't know about the new world, well, what else don't they know? Mm -hmm. On the other hand, um, the oration on the dignity of man perhaps sometimes overestimates an, uh, human, well, excellence and uh, perhaps underestimates human sin, since after all, Pico himself was poisoned to death at dinner. Uh, <laughs> so much for the dignity of man. <laughs> and uh, he wasn't the only one poisoned at dinner or poisoned with a handshake or, you know, um, I have mixed feelings about Renaissance humanism. Yes, there's a certain sort of grandeur to it, but there's also a kind of dangerous optimism about how great we are. Mm -hmm. You know, we're actually Janus faced. One of the, the questions that, the, that came in, um, actually there's two that came in that were very similar. One was a little bit more broad, one's a little bit more specific. Um, but one was, it will be most illuminating to hear uh, Dr. Segur's comparing, you know, how you compare and contrast the changing societal, societal norms um, between the 1500s and today, the 21st century. And then on top of that, to get a little bit more specific, another question was, is there anything uh, from Castiglione's life that compares to this pandemic situation in 2020? So if you could touch on both the compare and contrast and then a little bit more specific on the pandemic. Sure. Um, there were, <clears throat> Uh, epidemic diseases don't disappear. They're eventually rendered endemic, right? It's worth reading McNeil's books, Plagues and Peoples, um, to get a sense of how that works in history. So um, plagues came and went, particularly because um, Spain was a center of commerce now, uh, and it was a very one-sided commerce. They had lots of money and they could buy lots of stuff. So they did a lot of export of gold and silver, but also a lot of import of people and things. So they encountered a fair number of uh, diseases that went around without becoming a, a demographic catastrophe. Um, so I don't know that, uh, that a man for all seasons can tell us much about that, except to say that he would no doubt make covering up look easy and cool. How you would do that, I do not know. But the whole point of being a courtier is to take whatever situation you have and use it to the maximum utility and the max maximum benefit, all right? If you look at Machiavelli's book, Mandragola, you'll get a sense of uh, the sexual politics and uh, how important that can be in politics. And God knows we wouldn't have to touch it we wouldn't have to reach too far back in American history to find the importance of sex and politics, you know, in its many crazy manifestations. Um, but people, both according to Castiglione and Machiavelli, are primarily dominated by their passions. And the smart ones keep these passions well hidden. Got it. Thank you. Um, one of the other questions that came in from registration is a little bit more about the, the, the context, and the context and the concept. So I'm gonna read you the, the full question is, I am interested in learning more about the influence of the Book of the Courtier uh, in shaping the concept of the ideal royal court and promoting a model of courtly behavior. I would also be interested to find out more about the contemporary interpretations of the book, particularly the use of language such, such as the rhetorical strategies used in the text. That's a fascinating question. Um, I think the courtier is one of the great rhetorical achievements of the Renaissance. It's a, a, a true uh, gem of the high Italian Renaissance. And it's one of the 
it's one of the reasons why Machiavelli is as paranoid as he is. Yeah, he has good reason to be because he's surrounded by serpents like Castiglione. And of course, he's, he's the kind of serpent that doesn't look like a serpent. That's part of the job of Spezzatura. Instead, he talks ironically that the uh, courtier's main job, this is in book four particularly, um, is to raise the moral tenor, the moral tone of the prince whom he serves. <laughs> now the prince whom he serves, of course, is dead because he died in 1508. The Duchess has been ruling as regent for her son. And since the Duchess has a great influence on the boy and he has a great influence on the Duchess, he's actually done what Machiavelli says is possible without any of the mess that comes with trying to do it in the way that Caesar Borgia would. In other words, he's more of a fox than a lion. He's mm -hmm. such a fox that people didn't even know that he was running Urbino. And there's something that grates there. I mean, it's hard to have achieved such a thing. Uh, a feat of arms with, that didn't involve sh a sh firing a shot. So um, he has to, he feels constrained to write this into his book of uh, etiquette. But it is just as a standalone book of etiquette a really good book. If you get promoted to some place where you have to show responsibility and seriousness, this is actually a good book to tell you um, the, the beginning of wisdom is learning to shut your mouth. Don't talk until you're sure about what you want to say and until you've asked yourself who you're saying it to and why. If you're angry, count to 10 or 100 like Thomas Jefferson said. In other words, this is a very good advice for stepping into the big leagues anywhere. You want to get taken seriously? Stop acting like a kid. Okay. So yeah, there's a lot to be said for it just as a standalone book. And the reception was, uh, actually the church got angry with it because it makes a number of references to Fortuna. And Fortuna, uh, as we see it in Machiavelli too, is a pagan goddess of chance and of course, as we know, in Christian Europe, there is no pagan goddess of chance. God has everything controlled by his providential wisdom. And uh, it was put on the index for such references and also a couple of body references to priests, uh, which makes it all the more ironic, of course, that he ends up becoming a bishop just out of sheer um, uh, capacity. In other words, he was forced by the Pope to enter his service, which means taking holy orders, becoming a priest. There's no way around it. And just because he was so smart and capable, he ended up rising in the ranks of becoming a, a bit the Bishop of Avila because, well, again, he is a man for all seasons. If you had made him a Confucian uh, Mandarin, he'd have risen there too. Right? So a man for all seasons. Um going to for, for the man of all seasons going to your your analogy of the the serpent and the rat um i i did have i, I jotted down another question uh that that is do you think like we we've all agreed that that this is a book of manners that it's a good book of manners that it can be looked at today or in the renaissance that it was a bestseller um but do you think that that it was a little bit prideful and almost a want to let everybody know in a very undertone way that he had been ruling this this area of of, of Italy that he had grown and, and and escalated to that point and and this was well, how he did it. It is it is it's it's the kind of arrogant boasting that he says the gentleman doesn't do. Yeah, and what's great about the guy is that he doesn't do it. He writes the book, first of all, and he's not present there. Uh, the Duke is still alive in the book where he's dead by 1508 when, when Castiglione comes back from England. Uh, it also, he doesn't publish it until she's dead, just to make sure that even if someone does figure out what the underpainting is, it won't traduce her reputation because there's no harm that can come to her now. So. Uh, she dies in 1526. He's the Bishop of Avila looking back on a very strange life. In some ways, a fascinating Renaissance life. I mean, he's been all over. He was born into nobility, but 
He's been all over Europe. He's been a diplomat. He's been a courtier. He's been a leading intellectual. He's an esthete. I mean, look, he chooses Raphael for his portrait. He knows what he's talking about when it comes to fine art. I mean, this guy does it all. And uh, when he says you have to learn how to fight, you have to learn how to handle a sword, you have to learn how to uh, be a spy, you have to learn how to be able to dance and play, not play chess, though, that's too hard. <laughs> Here you hear a, a frustrated chess player. Oh, yeah. But, uh, you need to be able to do everything. And uh, he does a pretty good job as an etiquette book. The fact that he does more than that is what makes it such a splendid achievement. Mm. Um, I, I understand that. And, and it is an interesting layer to it because it is all about the like best ways to be the courtier. And yet there is this underlying like, but look what I did type of type of aspect to it. Um, yeah. And that just shows like human condition, which we've talked about in previous lectures, that there is always that little bit of hint of wanting to to gloat or to to display your achievements in some way, shape or a form. Once you give up on that Christian idea of humility and resignation before the face, before the almighty power of God, uh, the lure of hubris becomes unavoidable. That's why it's the Athenians that invent tr the tragedy. All right, it would have been a very strange things for thing for Christians to have invented. Now, one of the things that I found interesting uh, in my research of the book was one of the pieces of research I was reading introduced a parallel that I, I hadn't heard in your lecture um, or other areas that I had been looking at um, between the Jacobian play, The Duchess of Melfi. Are you familiar with The Duchess of Melfi? No, um, and the book of the courtier. Uh, the Duchess of Melfi um, is, is a play that focuses, and, and I studied it in college a little bit, so it's been quite a few years as well but it is a play that focuses on the corruption of court it's it's all about the corruption of court and uh one of the characters sits there and praises quite quite long-winded uh the french for their efforts to rid the court of sycophants troublemakers false advisors everything like that um the play continuously warns that if those in power are corrupt then all other levels of society will suffer so it's a very interesting and and of course this is jacobian so duchess amalfi mm -hmm. was written 80 years after uh, the book of the courtier. Mm -hmm. um, but it, it was an interesting parallel um, reached in my mind since I look at the book of the courtier as more as an instruction than a warning, or sorry, more as a warning. Let, let me read that sentence again as my notes, so I apologize. I look at the book of the courtier more as an instructive factor of how to be better um, versus as a warning of like, if you don't do this, then then this will happen. Um, but is there a little bit of that warning in the book of the courtier against, you know, you really have to, to watch the people in your court because otherwise it will be a trickle down effect of, you know, You're right. I mean, in other words, stabilization. the reason why Machiavelli is so paranoid is because of guys like this. And yeah, the idea is that if you're going to rise to power, you have to be smarter than your competitors and you have to be more covert and more carefully hidden than your competitors. And one, there are two ways you can get a throne. You can lay siege with an army or you can usurp. It turns out after the death of the Duke, the Duchess was regent. Once he seduced the Duchess and that for him was easy because he was a serial seducer. Um, uh, certainly relevant is Ovid's Art of Love, which is a neglected book, but a wonderful read because the same dispositions in the human temperament drive seduction then and now. And he says, look, ironically, be careful because there are many men who are well-versed in the art of seduction and you won't know them, you won't see them coming. <laughs> and of course he's talking about himself. Yeah. So uh, um, he's, yeah, it, it can be read as an anti-Machiavellian uh, book, which tries to close the gap between politics and ethics. It can also be read exactly the opposite way. Yeah, you have to close the gap between politics and ethics in appearance only. In reality, you need veer two in the Machiavellian sense, not virtue in Aristotle's sense. Well, and one of one of the things I found interesting based on your lecture, some of the research I did um, was is that 
like really the four nights, you know, the first three are very much the, the book of manners section, right? It's the fourth right. night that they start getting a little bit more into the philosophical. Mm-hmm. And um, there are essentially two contradicting philosophical views being talked about in, in, in the fourth night of, of the book, you know, one being uh, more of escapism about love, like you really focus on that and, and the, the wooing and the, the just love overall. And then one more on how one can influence your betters, especially like I think the example is one can influence the prince um, and almost kind of mold the ideals and the thought process of those who are actually making policy to what you want. And by, by listening to those, it, it almost seems like it all contradicts each other or neutralizes. So, so does Castiglione actually have a side he would prefer, or is it more along the lines of it could be either or? Um, I think that the presence of the uh, subtext means that the apparent text has to be ironic, at least partially. It doesn't preclude the possibility that it has a whole bunch of real good practical advice. That's what makes the subtext so brilliantly camouflaged because it's hiding in plain sight. That's, I think, why I had never seen it. I mean, I've been reading this book 35 years and I've always read, I had always read it as a straight etiquette book. Um, interesting because of some of what it tells you about Renaissance courts, but I wouldn't have called it in the first rank the way I would say the works of Machiavelli. Mm-hmm. Well, now when this young lady, a student of mine asked me, well, what sense does this make? I realized I didn't know and I never bothered to ask. And once I did, it was like, finding a flaw in a sweater, you know, that's been knit. And I kept on pulling on it. Eventually it unraveled the whole damn thing. And then what I was left with was this strange story, which told us something the opposite the, from the face story. And the deep text seems to say that politics is a question, like Machiavelli said, of being either a fox or a lion. But the real foxes, the, re, the lions get all the history, the real foxes, Nobody ever talks about them because they're so foxy, you don't even know they came and went. Yeah. That, so I think that goes back to what you're saying about the pride of Castiglione. It really rankles with the guy. He says, <laughs> you don't know what I did. And look, from a bishop, this is a very interesting book. Um, okay, I have two, two more quick questions for you. One, was Italy considered... Now this is the Renaissance, a lot of the Renaissance painters and everything were being influenced via Italy or, or from Italy. But was Italy considered a higher influence than other courts uh, during the Renaissance? Like French, Spain, English, a lot of things were happening in um, a lot of those courts at the time um, of the Renaissance. But where was the power in the courts at least an influence of each other? Do you okay. know? The Renaissance is a rebirth of Greco-Roman culture. Italy had a fair amount of Roman culture still there. But when the scholars left Constantinople in the generation or two before the fall of Constantinople in 1454, so that's what gives the Italian Renaissance a big boost before everybody else. So during the uh, 16th century and even the the late 15th century, Italy is at the forefront of the Renaissance. From there, it spreads out. It'll go to court, but it'll take a a century or so to get well implanted. Uh, In Spain, for example, Spain was always slow to adopt innovations. That's in part why uh, Cervantes writes Don Quixote. He says, oh, by the way, it's 1600, feudalism is over for God's sake. Can you get rid of the knightly and chivalry, the knightly stuff, the chivalry stuff, all this nonsense that has to go. It also takes a little bit longer, say a a century, um, to get to places like the Netherlands. So you'd be gonna gonna eventually get that beautifully detailed uh, Netherlandish school of Renaissance art, right? You you ever seen Albrecht Durer's Praying Hands? I mean, there's a beautiful piety in that piece and it comes from the faithfulness to what we see in the world. So uh, the 
background is that we got Greek culture from Greek speaking Byzantium before it collapsed. And the reason why we, why the Italians get it first is that that's the closest thing that they can run to, you know, it would be a long haul to go to England. Mm -hmm. And so they did that. They spent a couple of generations there teaching Greek to the Italians who already had Latin. And then from there, it spreads out over the next couple of generations thereafter to the rest of Europe. Okay. Um, and then finally, the, the question that does get asked quite a bit, um, I know that there are a lot of different versions out there. Do you have a favorite? I like the George um, Bull. Yeah, I like the George Bull in Penguin just because it's easily accessible. Mm -hmm. And I think it's a pretty, pretty uh, plausible kind of old fashioned translations. Um, I don't like interesting new translations, right? Um, my feeling for the most part with translation is that if you can write a better book, you should write it. And if you can't, show some respect. Maybe you shouldn't be, translators, I like them less flashy and more uh, accurate. Wonderful. Thank you so much uh, today for uh, joining us for, for the six lectures that we've already had this year. I look forward to, to working with you next year on some other books uh, that are coming up. Uh, for the rest of you that are still with us, we so much appreciate getting uh, the chance to talk with you and talk with the professor um, about a lesser known title, but interesting nonetheless, and one that has been well studied. If you are enjoying the Classics Revisited series with Professor Michael Sagru, we are hoping, as I've said, to continue the series in the new year. So please keep your eye on our website for more titles. We have also decided to make viewing of the series uh, with the professor available on YouTube. We are doing this because we have had numerous libraries ask if they could promote uh, these specific webinars to their patrons or if they get specific questions. So feel free to do so. Um, and starting uh, tomorrow, or they are already up, excuse me. I believe Kelly actually just shared the playlist on YouTube with the, the five lectures that we've already done and today's lecture will be on there by this afternoon. We do have two final webinars coming up in December to end our 2020 season. Uh, one is tomorrow focusing on digital sharing and collection development strategies. And the final one is next week on the 16th, which will be our third in a partnership series with the Educational Research Center. Uh, be sure to check out our website for more information on these. If the dates and times do not work for you, they are always re-recorded, or recorded, not re-recorded, recorded, recorded uh, for on-demand viewing. Just visit biblioteca.com forward slash events for more information. And finally, as we wrap up today, um, we would love for everybody to complete a quick survey, especially since we haven't actually chosen titles yet uh, to begin the new year with. Uh, that's something that uh, Professor Seguru and I will be working on in the next couple of weeks. Uh, so if you enjoyed it, um, please, please, please fill out the survey that will pop up um, after the webinar. Uh, it will pop up right in your browser. Um, if you have questions or title suggestions, please leave them in the follow-up survey as well. Um, and with that, from everyone at Biblioteca, thank you so much for joining us today, especially in this busy holiday season. And thank you, Michael, for leading today's discussion. Thank you.